Good afternoon. I will be standing up rather than walking because probably if I walk, you might doze off, acting as a pendulum at this late hour of the day. But first of all, I would like to thank the Basque Country and um, Technica for inviting um, Evet for this very important conference, very enlightening presentations that we have heard over this day, nine speakers before me. It's very difficult to say something new or use words which haven't been used during the day. So I have to be extremely careful what I say about higher education. But really, this has been a very interesting conference. It's, it's one of those conferences where you absorb so much. And then you ask the question that has been asked earlier on this morning. Do we, do we practice what we preach? And this has really stuck and has really made me think about all the discourse that has been going on on vocational education and training for these last 20 years. We have heard quotes from my colleague Joao dating back to 1996, 1999. 20 years have passed and we are here thinking about vocational education and training and how we can lift this important sector in education, which when you read the um, European area of education, which was published a few years ago, it's missing from the document. But VET is a reality. And here I'm representing the European Forum of technical and vocational education training. We represent 31 countries, over 187 members that more or less represent over a million learners. That is the hat I'm wearing today. But I'm wearing this hat because I come from a vocational college in my own small country, Malta. And the college by our size is a huge college because we have over 11,000 students who have chosen VET as the learning experience for a career. 20 years ago, this was not the situation in my country. And it's still not the situation in many European and non-European countries. No wonder Commissioner Tyson insists that we should promote VET as a first choice. If you dig deeper into what she has been saying for the last five years, it means that for many, VET is still not a first choice. And therefore, it was pertinent to hear this morning, do we practice what we preach? That was one of the questions that really made me think about the amount of talking that has been going on, not just at European level, but in many other parts of the world about what is the real value of vocational education and training. Then we were wondering, and we are questioning whether in the near future, robots will take our jobs. Well, my colleague Valentina has been distributing a um, leaflet about Evet's annual conference which will happen in the Azores in October this year. And incidentally, we will be talking about robots, human capital, digital learning. And we will be focusing on what I think could be the turning point for the challenges of higher vocational education and training. Because we will be focusing together with the employers who in my career have been my formidable partners. We've just heard our colleague from the Netherlands talking about the input and the interest of employers in the Netherlands. And he said, this is not enough. 
imagine where there is no involvement of employers in vocational education training, where there is no direct involvement of vocational education training by employers, you cannot talk about vocational education and training. So we want to manage transition and inclusion. And I think I will pick on these two words because what you will see in this presentation probably will bore you because you've heard all about what is happening today. But when I look at this slide after hearing nine other speakers before me, what I questioned myself is the following. If, if we were in this room, primary school children age seven to eight, imagine yourself going back some years and you are a primary school teacher here. Sorry, as a primary school um, student here. Probably the fourth industrial revolution for you will be insignificant. It will have no meaning. These are the young people that we are talking about. And hence why we have to talk about higher education as not being an additional bonus to vocational education and training. If higher education does not become part and parcel of vocational education and training, in the immediate future, we would have failed vocational education and training. So I was thinking about the cyber physical systems, the, a culture of computers, a culture of information technology, of virtual reality, seven-year-olds, for them, they, these will be toys. Probably they will have been bored by virtual reality and something new will come up. Three weeks ago, I was in Middlesex University and I was introduced to salt and pepper. Salt is the female robot and pepper was the male robot. And I found myself talking to salt and to pepper. And what I asked myself is, this is what I can see. Imagine what is behind all these inventions. Where is technology today, I asked myself. If I'm enjoying myself with salt and with pepper, where is technology today? Do we know where technology is as educators, myself as a principal? Do I know where technology is today? so that the young people coming out of the college, even though they might be 18, 19, or 20, they are ready, not for the fourth industrial revolution, but maybe for the fifth, or maybe for the sixth. The primary school child, in, in 50 or 60 years' time, will probably have experienced with the speed that we have heard about this morning and this afternoon, he might or she might have experienced the fifth and the sixth industrial revolution. So, technology is true, it's a, it's a driving force. But as educators, because here the majority of us are educators, the majority of us are people working in real vet. I spent five years instead of as director, and I bless the years I've spent there because it set my mind thinking on a much wider scale. But it was all about thinking, it was all about speaking about VET. When you immerse yourself in real VET, in the real problems, when young people go for apprenticeship programs and come back to college and challenge my teachers, this is for me a wake-up call. So we are promoting apprenticeships in my college to the extent that out of 7,000 full-time learners, almost 1,000 of them go into apprenticeship programs. When they come back, they have experienced a new world, which the teacher himself might not be so familiar with. This is a huge challenge. Technology has been the driving force, it's true. But how are we going to understand better what is happening behind the scenes to be able to prepare young people for a world which doesn't exist now, at least in the near future. So it's, it's natural that you think about 
concerns and challenges. And we've heard about the possibility of losing jobs. Funnily enough, my, my colleague, uh, Valentina, quoted me. I forgot that I wrote this. But she, she quoted in the pamphlet here that I have set up the team together with the colleagues. That's fine. And the rationale of the conference that I was talking to you about. And I said, and she quotes, so I must have said it, where robots could be entrusted with managing EVET's annual conference, the organizers and members would sit or simply sit back, relax, and enjoy the event. Did I say this? I must have said it because you quoted me. Which implies really what here? It implies that the world tomorrow will change, but to what extent are we prepared ourselves to understand what lies in the world of employment and the world of work is one of the huge challenges if we're moving into higher education. So these are some of the challenges that speakers this morning spoke about. I won't go into them. Automation you've heard a lot about. And uh, automated equipment is, ex is capable of extremely complex and challenging tasks. This is, these are things which we know. Try to find a file which dates back to 206. It will take you a day. If you do it on your own, ask your computer. It will do it in a second. These are the realities. You pick up your mobile phone, and you can talk to everyone. You go to your, to your, to your room in the, the hotel, and you are connected with everyone. So this, these are the limitations of human intelligence. And this is where automation comes in, where artificial intelligence comes in. And I think the, one of the speakers, when he said, Let's frame, let's frame artificial intelligence within the ethical boundaries. I think it was a very appropriate point that he has remarked this morning, and which I think we should reflect upon, because there are limitations to human intelligence, that's true. But I think human intelligence should put boundaries to artificial intelligence if we are to live in a better society. And if we are to Try to avoid, try to avoid what Stephen Hawking has said. AI, he said, is likely to be either the best or the worst thing that could happen to humanity. And I think this is, this is very possible. And the speakers this morning and this afternoon made it very clear. Maybe not, but maybe yes. And therefore, we need to understand better the impact that this will have on us. Robots are here today, that is very true. How will VET respond to industry demands is what I ask myself. And I am very convinced, also because I have been in vocational education and training for many years now, that VET, the added value of VET is that it has features which young people and older, per older persons can ascribe to, because it is learning by doing. It is work-based learning, which we've heard about. It is learning on the job. And therefore, they are here to stay. And therefore, we need to understand, therefore, what impact this will have on education and training and, and on our jobs. My belief is that human beings are better than robots. Now, you might disagree, you might agree, but I think there are similarities in our thoughts because human triumph over robots is in their capacity to make decisions. And because we are capable of making decisions, then we are capable of controlling how artificial intelligence will dominate or take over our lives. They can often be problem solvers, but again, we need to understand how young people could learn to become problem solvers in a culture where problems are being solved automatically. There are three words there that have been used this morning, creativity, innovation, and individual personalities. Are these attributed to artificial intelligence? Well, one of the speakers did say that 
artificial intelligence is the ability to accomplish goals faster, more precise, and in real time. How can this be transformed into a learning process? This is the biggest risk, lies in the triumph of artificial intelligence over human capital. Whether it happens or not, it depends where we take, where we take vocation education training. And the point I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing here is that the status quo today is not an option anymore unless vocational education and training moves into higher qualifications. So learning by doing, I spoke about, work-based learning you've heard about, and learning or the job are aspects of a new way of learning in today's automated society. I will not delve into the VET developments at the EU level because most of you are familiar with this long history now, since 2002, of trying to raise the profile of VET. A challenge for higher education in VET would be the image of VET, which we have been talking about for quite some time. And my conviction is that unless as VET providers, because EVET also and primarily represents VET providers, unless VET providers can have a stronger voice or as strong a voice as universities, traditional universities, we will never accomplish the mission of moving vocational education and training to higher levels. We understand as well that there are shifting roles of VET because of technology. And here I am saying nothing new from what you can see here. Most of this has been covered this morning. What I would like to emphasize there is that higher education in VET is becoming more visible. Thanks to several countries, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, Scandinavian countries, it's becoming more visible. Even outside Europe, higher VET is catching up with any form of education and training that requires research, that requires high levels of understanding the reality in which people will work. This is what research is all about. And I think the shifting role of VET we are all experience, experiencing, and therefore, for the time being, we can only talk about meeting the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. And here, just three underlined words which I would like to share with you, but probably they have been said in different ways during the day. I keep insisting the difference between somebody moving into vocational education training and somebody moving into a university of the traditional type. These are two different study and training environments. But in vocational education and training, up to the higher levels, up to the degree levels, I'm talking of bachelor's and master's and doctoral degrees, which hopefully my college will open up in two years' time. It, qualifications have to be industry-driven. It doesn't mean that industry-driven means that you forget about the educational components of the formation of the individual, of the citizenship aspect of an individual. But it means that any research being done at the higher levels should not be what people sometimes call blue sky research. It has to be applied research. It has to be impact research. The word was mentioned again even several times today. What impact will higher education leave on a workplace which is changing so fast that as educators, we might lose track. Some of the speakers also mentioned the fact that we ask ourselves, where do we want to go? If you, m most of you have watched Alice in Wonderland, when she came at a crossroad and the cat was there on the tree, bouncing from one place to another, and she asked him, which way to go, I think he answered her in the most appropriate way. Where do you wish to go? Where do we want VET to go? And here we have to be ambitious. We have to be ambitious and realistic about VET. VET is not the VET of the 20th century. 
vet should be the vet of the 21st century, with a view to at least 100 years from now, you might say, but what are you talking about? In hundred, how can we prophesy what will happen in 100 years? Hence, the importance of what has been spoken about this morning, transversal skills. Imagine if those 61 million that Madam Tyson was talking about had transversal skills, had basic skills, they wouldn't be marginalized. We wouldn't call them low-skilled individuals because they have basic skills. 61 million out of 500 million, my mathematics tells me, it's about 12 or 13% of the European population. Can we afford 12, 15%, even more, not to count the needs and others? Can we afford in, a, in an economy which we have said to the whole world, we want to be competitive, we want to be innovative, we want to be the top of the world? We cannot afford. Hence, transfers of skills can be infused if you have an industry-driven qualification and vocational training. It's work-based learning. One size doesn't fit all. I agree with what has been said before. We thought that one size fits all. We had so many early school leavers in our society. Why? Because we thought this is the only framework that you can fit into. No, it has changed. Technology has changed all this because technology is everywhere. From the moment you wake up to the moment that you sleep, you are being watched somehow. Try and buy an air ticket and then Google your thing on your mobile phone and the, the Google will start pushing up where you should go, what you should be doing. But I never said anyone to anyone that I'm going to Hong Kong, for example. A week after you buy a ticket to Hong Kong, you get these Google pop-ups coming up telling you where to visit, what to do, where to go, what to buy. Sorry, who's watching me? But this is the world that we live in. This is the kind of atmosphere that we know of. Imagine these young primary school boys and girls in 30 years' time. We cannot even imagine the world that they will be living in. The third is <clears throat> an added interest from employers. Thank God that there is an added interest from employers, otherwise we would not be moving forward. Understanding higher vets, we are still divided between what is the European higher education area and what is the European qualifications framework. Okay, we can live with that. We will not quarrel. Let's focus on the European qualifications framework and let's make this happen really in our systems. Some of the challenges very quickly because time is running out. The first is the image which I have already spoken about. What really brought change in my small country with VET is when we introduced higher VET. When we introduced degrees in my country, VET degrees at level six, parents' philosophy and outlook of VET changed dramatically because my son can go to college and get a degree. They can go to our old university <clears throat> over 400 years and they still get a degree. <coughs> The only difference they realized after is that when they come to college, unemploy unemployment will not be on the cards. They are getting employed while they study. And with the introduction of a renewed apprenticeship culture, they are being employed even before they finish. So, the second challenge, and I will finish with this, is the awareness of VET qualifications, it must be there. The third, it was mentioned by our Ms. Parker earlier on, recognition of prior learning, recognition of the value of VET is given by employers, and this is an added value to us. The jobs that employers are giving to our students is testimony of the value of vocation education and training and profiling is also an important aspect of VET. Let's be serious about VET. When we talk about quality in VET, let's be serious about what we're saying here. More challenges. The challenges of funding out of all the slides is what really hits me. Governance and funding. 
You can read the slide later, there are other challenges here. But governments need to be serious about VET. If we want young people to choose VET as a first choice, politicians must do the same before. This is the only way how people will be attracted to VET. And the third set of challenges is that VET, of course, must aim for social inclusion. We cannot afford dropouts. The economies cannot afford to have dropouts. And many higher education programs tend to serve a population that is not otherwise attracted to, vocation, to ed academic education. And we have to accept that. Probably 90% of us in this room have come from universities and not from uh, vocational education and training. This is the reality. But we come from another era. The children in my country, in 10, 15 years' time, there will be a parity between those coming from a 400-old university and those coming from our college. There will be equal numbers because we have raised the profile of VET. Then you can read the, 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 the next slides. I just want to end by looking at an important aspect which I have been talking about for quite some time now, those who have listened to me before. The more you talk about higher VETs and the more you talk about VETs, we need to shift to have a paradigm shift if we want to challenge what is happening in the labor market by stop saying to ourselves that we address stakeholders. You see, the, it's clear from what it says, the, 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 the slide is clear there, at least you can read it. When you have a stakeholder, a stakeholder has an invested interest in the success of your organization. But he can have a vested interest on Monday, he can lose it on Wednesday, he can pick it up again on Friday. What I'm trying to say is, there's no guarantee that a stakeholder remains your stakeholder. If we want to be serious about VET, if we want to really move into higher VET, which is an area which has been an exclusivity of universities, don't forget that. And the Bologna follow-up group is a strong lobby group, even with the commission. Because when you look at the Erasmus mobility, the next generation, VET is still 12% less than what universities will be getting. So okay, we can make it the first choice, but politically we have to make it the first choice first before we actually talk about the first choice. But the stakeholders might be with you, they might leave you. Shareholding is, uh, the, our Dutch colleague here said it before, he's not happy with so many companies. He wants to aim for 20,000 companies, correct? This is real stuff for vocation, education, and training. Shareholding. Because shareholding means that the employers are partly or partially owners of the education and training program. Otherwise, our vocational education and training will soon become irrelevant. And my fear of the future is it will be taken up by companies because we have failed because we have failed to give the skills and the competences that the labor market needs. And this is, for me, a challenge. And this is why we have to move into higher VET, because VET is not a second option. It's not an inferior approach to a career. There are very well paid jobs to our students who come out in various sectors, from pharmaceuticals to ICT to iGaming, and to shipping, this is what is happening. Our engineers are earning twice what the principal of the college earns. These are our own students. This is the future that challenges learners, but more importantly, it is challenging us who might not be ready for what the future is, is providing. So my conclusion is, is VET preparing our young learners and older workers to meet the challenges of the industry 4.0? Keep asking the question. And if you don't have an answer to it, ask the first question 
I have asked myself and which was said to us earlier today, do we practice what we preach? If we practice what we preach, and we have been preaching for the last 20 years, at least in Europe, even before, then we should have maybe not ready-made human capital for industry, but at least we will have human capital which can meet the challenges, not only of the fourth industrial revolution, which probably, if we come back to San Sebastian in about five or 10 years, we would say what we spoke about, the fourth industrial revolution, but we have to think ahead of that. And in order to think ahead of that, industry, employers, those outside the traditional education and learning must become part of what we're doing. They cannot remain stakeholders anymore because remaining a stakeholder means keeping VET in an inferior position vis-a-vis -vis the labor market. So I augur that when we talk about higher education and higher VET, it is not just recognition, it is not just quality, it is not just making sure that what we teach is relevant rather than not relevant to the world in which we exist, but that we what we teach today and what young people experience in our colleges is a replica, is a mirror of what is happening in the labor market. That is the first step towards really making VET the first choice, not just for the learners, but also for the employers. Thank you very much.